Has your life been changed by Jesus Christ? It's a question that we should always ask ourselves. It's a question that we should ask those that are around us. Have you been changed by Jesus Christ? Because if a person truly comes into contact with Jesus, there will be change. Is our lives built on Jesus Christ? Is our church built on Jesus Christ? If you have your Bible, I want you to open up to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, as we are in the book of Titus, we're, we're talking about church building. And when we think about church building, it, it brought to mind to me a story that probably many of you know, and I wanted to share it with you. It's about building a house. You see, there were three little pigs. And these three little pigs were building their houses. Now, you know the story. The first little pig built his house out of what? Out of straw. And when he had built his house out of straw, well, who so suddenly showed up on the scene? The big, bad wolf. And what did he do? He knocked on the door. Little pig, little pig, let me in. And what did the little pig say? Not by the hair. And the big bad wolf, well, he huffed and he puffed and he... All right, so that little pig then went scampering to his brother, the second little pig, who built his house out of sticks. Who built his house out of sticks. And after he had built his house out of sticks, well, who showed up on the scene? The, the big bad wolf. And little pig, little pig, let me in. And the little pig responded by saying, and so the big bad wolf, he huffed and he puffed and he, well, that little pig ran to, those two then ran to, their, to the third one. And that last little pig, he built his house out of brick. And of course, who showed up on the scene? The big, bad, little pig, little pig, let me in. And what did the little pig reply? You know, I didn't grow up on a farm, and so I didn't realize that pigs had hair on their chinny-chin-chins, but I guess they do, don't they? Well, the big, bad wolf, what did he do again? He huffed, and he puffed, and did he blow the house down? No, he did not blow the house down. So you had the three pigs, the three different materials. The straw came down, the sticks came down, but the little pig who built his house out of stone, out of brick, that one stood strong. Well, you know, we are not pigs, and there's not a big bad wolf, but we are God's people, and there is, in a sense, a big bad wolf or a serpent or a lion, Scripture sometimes call him. And there's times where he comes and he knocks and he says, let me in. And he tries to get in our lives. He tries to get in our homes. He tries to get in our church. He tries to get in our hearts. And as Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And there's times where sometimes we might reply no, and then he'll huff, and then he'll puff. And sometimes he blows our house down. Sometimes he knocks our lives over. And so how can we stand strong against the big bad wolf? How can our church remain strong against the big bad wolf? Is the key to build our church out of straw? Is the key to build our church out of sticks? Is the key to build our church out of bricks? No. Because when you think of the church, what is the church built out of? People. It's not a physical building that surrounds us. The church is the people of God. And the, and the church is not built with any material, but it is built by people. And when we think of that, how is a church strong when the people are strong? So then that leads to the question, 
Well, how are the people strong? If you have your Bible open to Titus chapter 2, we're going to be looking in the first 10 verses as we think about the character of the church. In Titus 2, starting in the first verse, the scripture reads this, But you must speak what is consistent with sound teaching. Older men are to be self-controlled, worthy of respect, sensible and sound in faith, love and endurance. In the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not addicted to much wine. They are to teach what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and children, to be sensible, pure, good homemakers, and submissive to their husbands so that God's message will not be slandered. Likewise, encourage the young men to be sensible about everything. Set an example of good works yourself with integrity and dignity in your teaching. Your message is to be sound beyond reproach so that the opponent will not so that the opponent will be ashamed, having nothing bad to say about us. Slaves are to be submissive to their masters in everything, and to be well-pleasing, not talking back or stealing, but demonstrating utter faithfulness, so they may adorn the teaching of God our Savior in everything. May God bless the reading of His Word. You see, when we think about the church, and we think about build God's, God building His church, and when we think about what makes a church strong, it comes down to, well, several things, but the thing that we're seeing in the passage that Paul is writing to Titus, it comes down to character. And we're thinking about character this morning. And when we think about it, the, the first thing that I want us to realize is that character indeed does count. Character counts. Keep in mind as Paul is, in, is writing to Titus, why is Paul writing to Titus? Because Titus is on the island of Crete. And on the island of Crete, there is a large Jewish population, and there is also a growing number of Christians. Some who might have, uh, the, the church there in Crete probably started on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached that great sermon. But as Paul uh, had journeyed to Crete, he knew that the church was in need of, of being built, of being strong. And so he left Titus there to give instructions to help them be the strong church that God had called them to be. Now last uh, week when we had looked at the last part of uh, Titus, uh, it, it talked about the warning that Paul gave about false teachers because there were people coming in teaching something that was contrary to the gospel message and because of the lies and deceptions it was threatening to weaken the church. And so it's interesting that in response to that, Paul doesn't then lay out a lengthy passage about sound teaching, though he does start with it for at the beginning in verse 1, he says, but you must speak what is consistent with sound teaching. And so in our minds, we might be thinking, all right, Paul just got done giving warnings and indications of false teachers and who they are and, and the consequences of, of following them and, and all that. So now he's going to be talking about sound teaching and even starts saying the importance of sound teaching. But then where does he go from that? He doesn't delve into the ins and outs of teaching. He delves into the ins and outs of character. Now, isn't that interesting? Because Paul knew that in contrast to the, the danger and the weakness of false teaching, there's a strength that comes with character. And it does tie into sound teaching that we're going to see in, in a moment. But the first thing that I want us to think about is that character indeed does count. Because a strong church is not built out of good people. I want to hear that. A strong church is not built out of good people people. Now the reason why I say that is because who is good? Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Jesus himself in John 10 verse 19 said that there is no one good but one God. And so what makes a strong church is not good people. A strong church is not built out of good people. A strong church is built out of changed people. Have you heard the phrase before that the church is not a museum of saints? There's a way that that often ends. It's not a museum of saints, but it's a hospital for sinners. And oftentimes that, that, that phrase is used and that imagery is used to confront a misperception 
that some people have about what the church is. There's some people that, that think the church should be filled of those who have no difficulties, those, you know, if, if I come to church, um, I need to make sure my act is all together. I need to make sure that I'm looking fine. When people ask me how I am, I don't dare say about the struggles that I'm going with because how would that make me look? But that's not what the church is about. And indeed, there's people in uh, the world who, who don't know Christ and, and they see the church and, and they get a bad taste in their mouths out of Christians who pretend to be perfect. Um, and so the response then is, well, the church is not meant to be a, a museum for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. After all, when Jesus came to this world, didn't it say that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost? And what did Jesus him say? That the healthy don't need a doctor, but the sick do. And who did Jesus seek out? Those who were sick and knew that they were sick and in need of, uh, uh, of, of a doctor. And so the church, in that sense, is not built out of good people, but it's built out of changed people. Because what makes a church strong as if we're talking about character counts, I'm not talking about how society defines character. When I was in middle school at Madison Middle School in Albuquerque, New Mexico, there was a brand new uh, program out called Character Counts, and we were taught the five pillars of character. Um, and we were kind of a pilot program, you know, for, for that school. Um, and that's not exactly what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the character of being just good citizens or being good people because how can we be good? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You see, the strength of a church is in the transformation power of the gospel. And that's where character, the character that God desires is found. In the transformation power of the gospel. For 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9-11 through 11, Paul says this, Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or anyone practicing homosexuality, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And some of you used to be like this. But you were washed. You are sanctified and you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You see, Paul was saying, sinners don't get into heaven. And he listed a bunch of them that was not an all-inclusive list. You could keep on going. These are the people who won't get into heaven. And then Paul says, and these you used to be. But notice what Paul did not say next. He did not say, but... You decided to clean up your lives, but you turned your lives around, but you put in the effort to be good people. Now, what did he say? He said, you were changed by Jesus Christ. You've been washed by his blood, and because of that, you've been justified, you've been sanctified, and you're a completely new people. It's just what I shared with the children, that in Christ, the old is gone and the new has come. You see, it's the gospel that changes lives. It's the good news of Jesus Christ that changes lives. So often when we encounter someone who's dealing with brokenness in their life, whether it's trouble in their marriage or their family or, or their work or personal struggles that, that they're in, or maybe they can't even put a finger onto it, so often what advice do Christians give them? Well, you need to try harder at this. Well, you need to do this. Well, why don't you come to church and, and, and try this? But how little do Christians say, well, Jesus Christ can change your life. Because who can change a life other than Jesus Christ? So often we try to put a band-aid on a broken heart, on a broken life. Well, band-aids are not good for healing, are they not? They just cover a wound. The answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so a strong church displays the gospel power of transforming lives in every type of person. And so that's what Paul is saying when, when, he's, when, he's, when, when he's telling to Titus about the importance of character in the lives from all the different groups, from the older men and the older women to the younger men and the younger women. Don't get sidetracked and think Paul is just talking about the importance of us being good people in the world. The reason that we can strive to be what 
Paul tells us to be is because the gospel changes lives. And the church, a strong church, reflects that to the world around us. That we are changed not because we are good people, not because we've done it ourselves, not because we figured out the key for ourselves. We're changed because Jesus Christ has changed us. And if we are, if we've truly encountered Jesus Christ, then we will be changed. And so do we reflect that change to the world? A strong church displays the gospel's power in transforming lives of every type. And then Paul goes into this list, and we see four different groups that he talks about, a, 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 well, really five different groups. He First, he talks about the older men, for Paul instructs Titus, Titus, you, when you are dealing with people, understand this, that those in the church, their lives should be transformed. And so let's break it down and talk about some of these groups. So Titus says, all right, our Paul says, Titus, when, when you instruct the older men, when you teach them, encourage them that this is how their lives should look if they are changed by the gospel. So the character of the older men, and by the way, what does it mean, older men? That's a category that is probably referred to those whose children have grown up and are now raising children of their own. And so he says they should be self-controlled, which can also mean sober. Uh, Not only sober from wine, but sober from any addiction in in, in their life. They should be self-controlled. They should be worthy of respect. They should be sensible. Now pay attention to that word because we're going to see it time and time again. Sensible. And they should be sound in faith, love, and endurance. Do those three things ring at all familiar to you? In 1 Thessalonians 1.3, as Paul was writing the church in Thessalonica, he said this about them, We recall in the presence of God and of our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and endurance of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul, in the other part, talks about the various gifts that God gives us, what did he say are the three greatest gifts? Faith, hope, and love. And so, Paul is telling Titus that instruct the older men that these things should be defining marks of their life. That yes, that to be self-controlled and worthy of respect and sensible, but they should be sound, they should be healthy in their love and in their faith and in their endurance. Because if you fall into that category, you need to know this, that even though your children are grown and, and have families of their own, a lot of men Um, when they reach that age, they hit this word that starts with an R. It's called retirement. Retirement. Some of you have hit that. Some just recently. Some of you might not be too far away. And there's a common observation in society that a lot of men, when they hit retirement, not all, but a lot of them, what sometimes happens in their lives, well, they've, they're, for several years, they've worked and worked and worked. They've raised their family, but now their family is gone. They're done from their job or their career. And sometimes it hits them, well, what is there to do now? Do I still have purpose? Do I still have meaning? You know, retirement is a modern convention of our modern society. When it comes to being a Christian, Understand this, that there is no retirement. In a sense, I guess retirement is when God calls us home. And so what Paul is is telling Titus is instruct the older men that as they are to have this character shining from their life, it should instill with them an understanding that their life is not worthless, their life is not without purpose, that they haven't finished, they still have a race before them. And urge them to finish well. And wasn't that indeed a mark of Paul's own life? That he wanted to finish well. And so older men, ask yourselves that question. How are you running your race? And what are you doing to finish well? Does the gospel shine forth from your life? In your love? In your hope? In your faith? To show you someone who is respectable to those around you. Someone who is sensible. Someone who is self-controlled. Are you finishing well? 
And then Paul moved from instructions from the older men to the instructions of the older women. The character that they should exhibit is that they are to be reverent in everything, that they are to be respectful in, in, in everything. Very similar to the older men being worthy of respect. And then Paul gives two interesting things. He says they are not to be slanderers and they are not to be addicted to much wine. Slanderers. The word slander is the word where we get the word devil from because that's what the devil does. He slanders the saints at the throne of God. And so when Paul talks about the older women not being slanderers, that really hits on the gossips, isn't it? Someone who speaks of others, someone who speaks evil, who slanders their character, who slanders what, what they do. And so, and so these older women on Crete are instructed not to be slanders and not to be addicted to much wine because they also, their children are, are grown and have families of their own. And what happens when all of a sudden you have all this extra time on your hands? And so obviously there is a problem in Crete of these two things. Now, are there other things that you can do wrong with your time. Yes. But these two things were obviously of, of detriment happening there on Crete, and so Paul specifically called them out. But in a sense, what Paul is saying is teach them to use their time wisely, not in tearing down others or not in tearing down themselves. But notice what he says at the end, uh, um, at the end of verse 3. It says they are to teach what is good. And in the Greek, that word teach, your translation might say uh, instruct or encourage. It means to sensibly teach. Have you heard that word sensible before? With the older men, now also with the older women, that they are sensibly to teach. And so what Paul is saying, so they are not to be in the business with their time of tearing down their lives and others but instead of building up by teaching sensibly as they display character of respectfulness in all that they do. And so, women, if you fall in that category of older women, how do you use your time? Do you use it in building up those that are around you? Do you use it in building up your life as well? Are lives built up for what you are doing for the cause of Christ? Does the gospel shine through your life to encourage others and build them up in a sensible way? And then Paul moves his focus then to the instructions of the younger women. And the character that he says that they are supposed to have is first of all that they are to love their families. They're supposed to love their husbands and love their children. And keep in mind the culture at Paul's time was very different from, all, from our culture. Today, and you can answer this very easily, what is the number one reason people get married in our culture? They love each other. They love each other. Um, you know, isn't that what all the romance movies are about? You know, when they, they meet, they fall in love, and so they, they get married. Was that the pattern of what happened in the culture in, in, in Paul's day? No. You know, women married young sometimes as young as 14 or 15, sometimes later than that. And sometimes it was, oftentimes it was an arranged marriage. And so love was not something that happened before the marriage started. It was something that was learned during the message. I'm not talking necessarily about the emotion of love because love is not an emotion. Love is a choice. Do you know the number one reason why couples get divorced today? Or what they tell their... Because there, there was a study done. There was a, uh, a Christian counselor. And um, he went and he looked at, you know, all right, why are these marriages falling apart? What are they saying to me? And in and, and studying tons of marriages that were falling apart, you know what the number one reason people said? Don't love each other anymore. And doesn't that make sense? If we get married because of our feelings for love then when those feelings go away, that's why we get divorced. Well, love is not feelings, and marriage should never be based on feelings. It should be based on love, which is a choice. And this is why Paul was saying, all right, so, you know, whether you knew your husband or not, whether, you know, uh, no matter how arranged it was, 
The mark that should define you is to love your family, to love your husbands, and to love your children. Not be in love with them, but to love them. Because that is a choice, an action, a decision to take. And even though we live in a much different culture today, that still should be a defining mark out of our lives. And so women, do you choose every morning to love your husbands or to love your children? Do you choose to love them? Sometimes that can be hard to do because we men, and I remember what it was like to be a child, are not always the easiest to deal with. But do you choose to love? And then also notice what Paul says about the younger woman. Not only do they love their families, but they are to be sensible. Have you heard that word before? To be sensible. They are to be pure. They are to be good homemakers. Now that causes sometimes a lot of questions. Well, isn't that just an archaic thing? Because, you know, is Paul just saying, um, you know, that women cannot contribute to the household, that they are just to stay home and, and not do anything else? When you, when you look at Proverbs 31, which is the marks of a godly woman, notice that she was involved in some transactions uh, as well. So what does it mean to be a good homemaker? Does that mean that to be, make sure that the house stays clean, that your husband stays fed, that you're a good servant that says yes, dear, and does everything your husband wants? Is that what it means to be a good homemaker? Well, remind me this. What makes the church people? So what makes the home people? It's not necessarily about meals and cleanliness, but it's about taking care of your family, which, by the way, will happen if you choose to love them. So how best to raise your children? How best to be a wife to, to your husband? Because the last characteristic is, Paul says, is there to be submissive, which I know women, that always thrills you when the Bible talks about being submissive to your husbands, right? Well, understand this. Submissive is not the same thing as obedience. It can include that, but it's not the same thing. In Ephesians 5, it fleshes, it fleshes that out much more as Scripture calls wives to be submissive, but it also calls husbands to love sacrificially as Christ loved the church, to give their lives for them. You know, I've never known a marriage that had sacrificial love and had submission that broke apart. But I've known relationships where they mutually submitted by sacrificing in love and submitting to the godly authority. I've, I've seen those relationships be strong. So it's not just, I do whatever my husband says because he's the boss and I'm his slave. No, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the order that God has given the family. Because subordination, being uh, submission, is rooted in love, not in duty, which goes back to the first characteristics. Wives, love your families. Because if you have the gospel shining through your life, then what's going to shine through? Love. And then he moves his focus to the younger men. And what is supposed to be the characteristic of younger men? That they are to be sensible. There's that word again. We've heard it now in all four with the older men, the older women, the younger women, and now the younger men to be sensible, to have good works, to have integrity and dignity. You see, there's a danger of young men and men. We easily fall into this danger of not living sensibly, of not living with integrity and of not living with dignity. And our society just makes it worse because our society has created something that had never existed in the history of mankind. And it's called this teenagers. And what I mean by that is not that in the history of mankind, there's never been someone who's been aged 13 through 19. What I mean by that is in the ancient societies, you went from being a boy to being a man. You went from being a boy to being a husband. There was no decade span where you are physically mature, but yet you're just hanging around doing nothing. And 
our society has added to this problem of ongoing childhood. Because we as young men are not called just to play games and entertain ourselves to death. We are called to good works. We are called to integrity. And we are called to be sensible. There's times that we need to grow up. And that is what Paul is calling Titus to instruct the young men to do. Because that problem is obviously rooted in the sinfulness and fallenness of mankind. And we're living in a society that just makes it worse. And so if we are Christians and if we've been changed by the gospel, then does that shine through our lives? Or are we just following what society says we should do? You see, in all four, it talks about being sensible, being sensible, being sensible. Because we live in a chaotic and fallen world. And the world, to those around us who do not know Christ, the world does not make sense. And we are supposed to make sense for them. And the only way that we can make sense is by having Jesus Christ shine through our lives. Because if we don't have Christ shining through our lives then what sense do we give the world around us? So whether you are an older man, an older woman, a younger woman, or a younger man, if Christ is in you, do you give sense to the world around you? Because the church's character, again, it's not about being good people, but it's about being transformed people. Galatians 5, 22 through 24. But the fruit of the Spirit... Notice this is not saying, but what you should strive to do, or it's not saying, but this is what good people are about, but the fruit of the Spirit. So those who have the Spirit in them, those who have Christ in them, has this fruit coming from their lives. And what is it? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Why? Because now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And Christ shines through us because character indeed counts. But not only do we see that character counts, but secondly, I want you to see that character is caught. That character is caught. Yes, character results from a transformed life, but character is also developed. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 through 8, Paul says this, Rather train yourselves in godliness. How many of you have ever trained yourselves for a sport or for some sort of physical event, whether it's a marathon, a race, a walkathon, um, you know, for a game? Anyone ever trained themselves? Michael, kind of. You know, when you train yourself, what? You put in effort, you put in time. Because your muscles do not become strong just by sitting down and doing nothing, do they? So you train yourselves. So as we train ourselves physically, we're also to train ourselves in godliness. For the training of the body has a limited benefit, but godliness is beneficial in every way since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. And so character, yes, it it comes naturally from a transformed life by the Holy Spirit, but it also comes by being developed because character does, is, is indeed caught. It's caught, first of all, through sound teaching. And that's where the teaching comes into play in verse one, but you must speak what is consistent with sound teaching. Again, Paul was dealing with, or Paul was warning Titus with some of the false teachers that were going out there because when false teaching comes into play and people start following it, it robs them of following God. And when it robs them of following God, it robs them of their spiritual health and it starts to crumble and destroy the church because it also robs them of their character in Christ. But sound teaching does the opposite because God's word transforms lives. If you truly are rooted in God's word, and if God's word abides in you, it will result in a transformed life. Sound teaching is not just about instructing our minds. It's about training our hearts. It's about guarding our hearts. It's about us being made and made more into the image of Christ who is within us. 
In 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, Paul said this, All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. Why? So that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every what? Good work. Basically, what Paul is saying is Scripture is useful and beneficial, and when applied correctly into your life, it will equip you to live a good life for the good works that God has prepared you for. That character will come shining forth from your life. And so sound, healthy teaching is important to character. And so that's why throughout this, these 10 verses in chapter 2, time and time again with different words, different instructions, Paul is telling Titus, but speak this, encourage this, train this, teach this. Because it's important that healthy teaching, training happens within the church. It's specifically mentioned with the older women to give instructions to the younger women. But that same thing can be applied to the older men giving instructions to the younger men. We are all called to teach others around us. We're not all called to teach a Sunday school class. We're not all called to teach a Bible study, but we are all called to pour our lives into someone else. And so if you are an older woman here, you are called to teach and train up a younger woman. And if you're an older man here, you are teach and you are called to train up a younger man. All of us are called to pour our lives into one another. If you have the sermon outline with you, on the very bottom of the outline, it says name and then it has a blank. If you don't have a sermon outline, I want you, if you have a piece of paper, to write down a name. And the name I want you to write down is someone within the church that you can pour your life into. I'm not talking about those outside of the church though we do need to pour our lives into those outside of the church, but in the context of what we're looking at today, who in this church can you pour your life into? And I want you to write down a name or to have a name in your mind. Because if we are not pouring our lives into each other, if we're not teaching others and training others, then we are not leading to the strength and the health of the church. So who can you pour your life in? Because teaching should happen within church relationships. But then teaching should also happen within family relationships. Parents, do you teach your children? And the bulk of that responsibility throughout history has been carried out by women. But biblically, the bulk of that responsibility should be carried out by men. So husbands, do you lead your family in the instruction of God's Word? How often do you sit down with your family and talk about God's Word. Talk about what God is doing in your lives. How often do you have a family devotion together? Have you ever had a family devotion together? Do you pray together as a family? Some families pray just at meals and at bedtimes, and that's not bad. But is that the only time that we should pray together as a family? Unfortunately, Women have carried a bulk of the work, and unfortunately, a lot of families just place the responsibility at the church. We give our children to Sunday school and to Wednesday nights, and that's where they'll get their instruction. That should just supplement the bulk of the instruction that happens at home. And so if you are living with children, no matter how young they are or no matter how old they are, do you teach your children and instruct them? Well, we at, here at Central Baptist, we want to help you and give you some tools to do that. I've been talking with Brian and, and what, we're, what we're going to 
start offering, and we're going to start this next week, is a family Bible study. Every week, the church will have available a Bible study that you can take and you can go with your family through. And it's a Bible study. It's the John MacArthur Bible study. And we're going to be starting in the book of John. And we're going to give you a tool because you might say, I have no clue how to teach. I have no clue. I mean, yeah, I can open up Scripture and I can read something, but what do I say? What do I ask? How do I know what, what, to, what to look for? And so if you're not sure, well, we're going to help you in that training so you can develop that, so you can be the spiritual leader that you are called to be, and parents that you can teach your children. And Brian is even going to have a video on YouTube of him doing it with his family so you can kind of see how it goes. Not that he's the perfect family, but just another way of looking at it to, to seeing, all right, this is, this is something that might work for my family. You don't have to do it the way Brian does it um, because who here is exactly like Brian? No one. And that's a good thing. But it's a good thing that he is who, who he is. But that's going to be provided for you, and we'll have that uh, a link of, available uh, next week. We'll give you the details with that. But just so you can have that visible resource if you want it. But we're going to provide these every week so that you can take them, and as a family, you can start digging in the Scriptures. Now, you don't have to use this. You can use whatever tool that you want. But we want to provide you with something because oftentimes, and I'm guilty of this, you know, as, as teachers and pastors, we say, all right, you need to do this. And you're like, all right, I want to, but how? So we want to put something in your hands that will help you to answer that question, how? Because teaching is so very vital, not just for us to gain knowledge, but for the gospel, which changes our hearts to shine through us. Because character is caught. It's caught in the relationships, that's church. It's caught in the family relationships. Character is caught through sound teaching, but character is also caught by example. And that's why in verse 7, Paul told Titus that he himself should set an example of good works. So if we teach these things, do we also exemplify these things? I read once of a pastor who was writing, and he went to visit a family in his church, and when, when he got to this family, he was visiting with, with the parents. And he noticed that their living room carpet was in shambles. It was, it was worn. It even had some holes in it. And that did not reflect the rest of the house. The rest of the house was kept in order. It was actually a nice-looking house. And it was just so odd that the carpet was so different than the rest of, uh, of the house. And he was just so curious about it. Well, near the end of his visit, the, uh, the, the wife, she noticed that his eyes would constantly kind of looked, you know, to, to that carpet. And she kind of smiled and she said, I bet you're wondering why our carpet looks so hideous. And the pastor admitted, well, the thought did, you know, come to my mind. And she said, well, I want to share with you, um, a couple years ago, my, as you know, we have a couple teenage son and them and uh, their friends, there are about eight of them all together. They were in our house uh, together as they uh, a lot of times are, uh, hanging out, uh, you know, playing games and so forth. And I told them, all right, I need to clean house, so I'm going to kick you guys out. Go hang out somewhere else so I can get my house together. And one of them said, well, where do you want us to go? And she asked one of the boys, well, why don't you go to your aunt's house since he lives with his aunt? And he <laughs> laughed. He said, there's no way she'll want all of us there. And she looked at another boy. She said, well, what about your mother? And he said, my mother would never allow eight of us in her house at the same time. We might break something. And in talking with each of them, they had different backgrounds and, and different home lives. But she realized that hers was the only house that allowed all of them to come together, to hang out, and to play together. And so she let them stay. And she said, and they are over all the time. They run in, they run out. Yes, there's times it drives me crazy. But that's why our carpet is so worn out and we're looking at getting it replaced soon. But I know it won't take long for that one to get worn out either. And when the pastor left, he said, you know what? That is the most beautiful carpet I've ever seen. Because she was demonstrating something not only to her son, but to his friends. She was setting an example of, to them. You know, how we live our life in the example that we give is caught 
by those around us. So yes, it's important for us to teach God's Word, but it's equally important for us to exemplify God's Word because character is count, does count, and it is caught. And then lastly, I want you to see that character calls. Because we're talking about the strength of the church and how the gospel transforms lives. And ultimately, what's the point? Ultimately, what's the result? In verse 5, in verse 8, and in verse 10, there's three different results. As Paul is talking about character, live this way so that this happens. You do this and have this character shine in you so that this happens. Live your life in such a way so that this happens. And notice what they are in verse 8 as Paul is done giving instructions about the character of the women in the church. He says, so that God's message will not be slandered. In verse 8, as Paul is done giving instructions to the men of the church, he says, so that the opponent will be ashamed having nothing bad to say about us. And then at the end of verse 10, as he had talked about the slaves, which, by the way, we haven't talked about this morning because we're going to go more into detail about that next week. But at the end of verse 10, after he gives instructions for the character of slaves, he says, so that they may adorn the teaching of God our Savior in everything. Are you hearing the common theme? How you live your life will influence how those who do not know Christ respond. Because character the character of the church will either attract others to Jesus Christ or it will repel them away. How the character of your home will either attract others to Jesus Christ or repel them away. The character of your life will either attract others to Jesus Christ or it will repel them away. Or will repel them away. My prayer is that what Paul said and Romans 2.24 will never be said about you, our families, or our church. For as, for as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. You know, we have an enemy, that big bad wolf who is looking around, who huffs and puffs and blows lives over and destroys homes and destroys life and robs God of his glory. We do not need to give him any more ammunition to keep people from the cross of Jesus Christ. We need to let Christ shine through us that the gospel would be graced with the character of Christ of a transformed life. Chuck Colson, in, on April 23rd of 2008, wrote an article in the Christian Post. And it, even though it was written in 2008, which was a few years ago, man, it seems like it could have been written today. For he said, a few days ago, Fox News ran a grim special titled Jihad USA, confronting the threat of homegrown terror. See why I said it sounds like it could be written today? It was a warning of the continued danger of Islam fascism. The program probably deepened many Americans' fear of and hostility towards Muslims. That is unfortunate because most Muslims are not would-be jihadists. But we Christians especially need to guard our emotions so that we can be good witnesses to Muslims. A caution raised by Dr. Dudley Woodbury, professor of Islamic studies at Fuller. Woodbury aware that throughout the world, Muslims have been turning to Christ, and that is indeed true in places in the world that the vast majority of the people practice the Islam religion, there are hundreds and thousands turning from that religion, turning to Jesus Christ. And, and, and he wanted to find out why, because especially in a lot of those countries, the cost of them converting to Christianity is so high. It can cost them their jobs, it can cost them their families, it can cost them their very lives. So why, what is causing them, what is attracting them to Jesus Christ? What is it that is causing them to turn? Well, to find the answer, he created a detailed questionnaire over a 16-year period. Some 750 Muslims from 30 countries filled it out, and the results are eye-opening. The number one reason Muslim converts listed for their decision to follow Christ was the lifestyle 
of the Christians around them. It was the character of the Christians around them. You know, sometimes when we look at the world around us and when we see the mass number of people in some places that are coming to Christ, and then we look at our own country around us, and yes, there are pockets and there's times where there's large numbers that come to Christ, but overwhelmingly in our country, it's so small comparatively. comparatively. And there's probably a lot of different reasons for that. But I just happen to wonder if the number one reason these Muslim converts gave for coming to Christ was the character and the lifestyle of the Christians around them. And when we look at our own country and we know the statistics, that statistically Christians here in our country live no differently than the world around them, then is it any wonder why we are not seeing more and more people come to the cross of Jesus Christ? Well, he goes on to say this. He says, that Muslim converts noted that there was no gap between moral profession and the practice of Christians they knew. An Egyptian convert contrasted the love shown by Christians with the unloving treatment of Muslim students and faculty he encountered at a university in Medina. Other converts were impressed that Christians treat women as equals and enjoy loving marriages. And poor Muslims observed that expatriate Christian workers they knew had a Adopted, contrary to their expectations, a simple lifestyle. They wore locally made clothes and abstained from pork and alcohol, so not to offend Muslim neighbors. And not just talking about Muslims, but any group or, or religion. How often through media, social media, or in conversations, do I hear things that, does not speak well of our neighbors. Sometimes we speak out of fear. Sometimes we speak out of frustration. But our words affect, and our character affects, how how others respond to Jesus Christ. Finally, and this is the key, when Christ's love transforms committed Christians into a loving community, many Muslims identified a desire to join such a fellowship. His research shows that when the church is being the church, witnessing to the love of Christ and of his transforming power, Muslims are drawn both to us and to him. The church is not a museum of saints, but it's not a shelter for sinners. It's a hospital for those who have been transformed by Jesus Christ. Because our character counts. Yes, it's caught but it calls to the world around us. Does our character call others to Christ or does it repel them away? Let's pray. 